continue talking about JavaScript today. And uh, we left off, we were part of the way through a, um, an image swapping. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, finish that up. And again, I want to explore the notion of refactoring. And refactoring is where you take code that works and you make it better. All right? Take code that works and make it better. Code that works is not like the end all. Code that works is necessary but not sufficient to be good coding. All right? In other words, if it doesn't work, then I don't even want to talk about it. Right? You got to fix it. But if it does work, that doesn't in itself make it good. What makes it good for, uh, in a large degree is the, the level of maintainability that it has, the ability to go and make changes to it. Because we know everything changes, you know, for whatever reason. And so um, it, it can be, you know, even talking about on a bigger system level, you know, companies get bought out by other companies, right? Um, laws change. You know, if you talk about a payroll application, uh, the way that you calculate taxes can change, you know, withholding taxes. All kinds of things change, and therefore your software better be able to accommodate it. Now, you can't necessarily anticipate every change that's going to occur, but you can develop your code in such a way that it's easier to change or harder to change, and you want it to be easier to change. All right, so let's download what we had last time, and ah. <laughs> Is that a corgi? <laughs> yeah, my mom had a corgi. Aww. I'm looking for like a kick me sign like written over there like with the arrow. Yeah, right. All right, so this is where we left off last time. You know, when I see things like this, I wonder, I wonder if like the dog is thinking like, you know, the first time I get a chance, I am going to kill you. I, when you're napping, I'm going to go and I'm going to bite you in the neck and you're going to bleed out, you know. But, all right. Anyhow, this is what we had last time. And if I'm not mistaken, we only did the one to mouse over and change that. And on mouse out, there was really no need to do anything. So we're going to keep it like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make this a little, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of styling. And I'm going to change it so the other ones work as well. So let's go and let's open this up. And I can copy all this. <coughs> all right. Then I'm going to do something like, add a little bit of style to it.
So we add a little bit of style by, uh, to this to, to make the, the thumbnails and the galleries, uh, the thumbnails and the bigger picture go side by side. So we'll see how that works. No, because it's not contained in that. Oh, the, it would make the thumbnail. You're right. I should, I should do the ID of... In fact, I shouldn't even do that. I should put a div around it because I don't want the image itself to be bigger because that could get distorted. So I'll make the div bigger. All right, so we look at this, and here's what we have. Pardon me? Yeah, it should go next to it. Pardon me? Oh, thanks. No, you're, you're right. Good call. And there we go, except... I have an extra quote in here. Yeah, we do. We were missing a quote. Yeah, we don't have an extra quote. We have a missing quote. There we go. All right, there we go. All right. So let's go and let's put a margin on this of 30 pixels. All right. All right. And you can fiddle with it to get it the size and everything that you want. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this below. Um, I'm going to duplicate this, you know, simulating we have a second photo gallery. And we don't have a second photo gallery, but we'll pretend, all right? I'll just do it with the same images. So let me just copy this. And I have to change the function then because I don't want to change big pick. I want to change big pick one. All right. And now I have that and that. Second gallery. Now, if we look at this, we see that we have repeated ourselves. All right. We have code that is just about the same except for a couple of things, all right? In other words, the difference, every one of these on mouse over events looks the same. What is different is the image that we're going to change it to and whether we're changing the first big picture or the second big picture. Other than that, everything is the same. When you see this kind of repetitive code, it should set an alarm off in your head that this is something that could be taken and written in a function. And we can then go and we can call that function over and over again so that if we added a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, whatever, changing this and maintaining this would be simple. So, what are the arguments going to be to this function? What, what parameters do I need to pass to this function? The idea of what? Okay. Can you repeat that? 
the, well, not the name of the thumbnail, the name of the picture that I want to change to, and what else? Where I want to put it. In other words, the name of the big image that I want to change. In other words, if you look at this, the arguments are going to be the pieces that are different, because those are going to get plugged in. So this is different from here to here. This is different from here to here. So that's what we're going to pass in to the code. So I'm going to go and create a function. How do I create a function? I use a script tag that's very similar to the style tag in that it tells the browser that the code contained in here is not HTML code. It is JavaScript code. I define my function. The convention is to, uh, I've heard people call this camel case, which I, 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 I think is a dumb term, but it's where the first letter is lowercase, then the first letter of each additional word is uppercase. So swap image. And it's going to take two arguments. And I can call them anything, but I want to give them meaningful names so that at a glance you can tell what it is. Um, I like to give arguments, start them with the prefix arg. That way if I'm looking at the code, I know that this is an argument. That is, I know it's something that gets passed into this. Um, what you can also do is you can prefix it with the type of data it is. Like sometimes people will put str in front of a string, i in front of an integer, and so on, b in front of a boolean. Um, then there are global variables and local variables that we're not going to really talk about here, but so on. It's good to have a naming convention, all right? Um, I can tell you what people do as far as, as that goes, you know, and, and they do the things that I just described. But how do I want to say this? The specific naming convention you use is less important than the fact that you use some sort of naming convention. All right? So, in other words, I would not call a variable that was not an argument ARG. I would not start it with ARG because that would then be confusing. All right? Um, some organizations, if you worked for a bigger organization that did, you know, software development, some of them have like standards about like this is how you're going to code. You're going to code in variables. This is, this is how you name the variables and so on. We even had a, uh, the one particular job that I had at a big um, manufacturing automation, whatever you want to call it, um, um, company, um, they had like a sheet, a list of you know, standard abbreviations. So product number, or like let's say there was a product number. I don't remember if there was or not. But if you're going to use product number, it should be prod num, for example. All right? So if you have machine product number or part product number, it would always be consistent. Part, prod num, machine, prod num, or something like that. And really the reason for that is especially when you get involved in larger software development projects where multiple people are looking at it, that takes a maintainability issue and, uh, you know, amps it up quite a bit. Um, there's places in programming for creativity, uh, naming variables isn't necessarily one of them. <laughs> All right, you want to do it in a way that will be readable and especially if you're working with a lot of uh, a lot of people. <laughs> All right. So, one thing I do sometimes if I want to write a function or something like that is I will take a hard-coded version and figure out what needs to be placed, be replaced by 
arguments. In this statement here, this is going to be replaced by arg ID. All right? Now, arg ID is a variable and it's going to have a value. Therefore, I do not put quotes around it. Were I to put quotes around it, it would look for an ID named literally arg ID. So I don't want literally arg ID, I want the name of the ID. So, arg ID and the file name, same thing applies here. And we do that. Now, uh, as far as comments go, um, it's good to put comments in your code. When you put comments in your code, how do I want to say this? Explain why you are doing it. Not, don't explain simply what the statement does. Like a, an example of a, a, a bad comment would be change the source attribute of the element on the page with an ID of arg ID to the value of arg file name. Yeah, what is, what is wrong with that other than it sounds goofy and it's wordy and so on? In essence, all that comment is doing is, is explaining the syntax of that statement. Anyone that understands JavaScript, if they saw this line of code, would know what that meant. It means it takes and goes and does this. So all I've done is literally explained what that statement does. And that's not really the place of, for comments. The place of comments is to explain why you are doing this. All right? So in this case, I'm going to say change image to the larger image um, corresponding to thumbnail or something like that. All right? I'm not convinced that's a good comment, but at least it's better than the previous one, all right? Previous one, all I did was explain what the statements do, you know? So like if you have x equals zero, you know, don't say this instruction sets x to zero, all right? Say I'm going to calculate the total tuition charge and I'm initializing the tuition to zero, all right? That's a more meaningful uh, usage of it. All right, now when we call it, it should be more straightforward to do it. All I should have to do is say swap image and I need to give the file name and the ID, so one dot JPEG and big pick. Looks good. Well, let's not get crazy. Now, if I, um, what I probably should be doing here is I should have done one and tested it, but I'm feeling pretty confident today.
All right. So now, and it continues to work. So, we've done the same thing, but our code is uh, much more reusable, much more efficient. We could even take this code, if we wanted to, and put it in an external file, like we did with CSS. And then we could have the swap image on any page. We could in include that just like you um, do with an um, external uh, JavaScript file. I'm sorry, an external CSS file. Um, questions about this? There's one more piece of JavaScript that I want to cover, and we can start it today, and we can, we'll, we can finish it um, next time. And that will be JavaScript for validation of a form. All right? Um, that is another very popular use of that. Now, remember we talked about HTML5, there's some built-in validation in the form controls to begin with. But until we can be assured that there's widespread use of that, we're going to need to write some sort of validation for that. So let's go. And I'm going to make a form. And I'm just going to put a um, couple fields on it. And we're going to validate it. So I'm going to say form action equals pound sign method equals post no, method equals get. Then we're going to put a couple text boxes here. In the interest of time, I am not going to put in the labels, the label tags, but you know that you should do that. So I'm not going to focus on the formatting of that. I'm going to use a name and an ID. All right. The reason I'm doing that is they're used for different purposes. The name is used by the server-side script that's going to be processing this. Let's assume this is a form to enter and update a database or something like that. All right. The ID is a convenient little hook for us to use in JavaScript. So I think we talked about this before when we talked about labels, but it's common for a form element to have both a name and an ID for that reason. All right. Um, I usually make them the same, and that hopefully minimizes the chance that I'll get it wrong. All right. So I'm going to do something where I'm going to make a, just a simple form where the person types in their name and age. And I changed my mind. I am going to put the label tags in because accessibility is important. I shouldn't short change accessibility because it's not really that big of a deal. Label for equals txt name. And what does this do? This simply allows screen readers and other assistive technologies to associate the label with the form control. People that can see do that visually. They see it's next to it. People that can't see can't do that visually, and therefore they need the label tag. So 
So I'm going to make a submit button. All right, and here we go. All right, here we have our form. And right now, if I press, press the process form button, it submits it to itself because I set the action to be pound sign. But if you notice, there's nothing in the query string for those fields because I didn't enter anything in there. Well, that's probably not good, right? Um, if we were imagining this, say, connected to a database or this connected to an application, the server can't do anything if the data isn't there, all right? So why even bother the server sending them data that the server can't possibly process? Let me give you a more realistic example. If you're placing an order on, on some online shopping site and you didn't put in a credit card number or you didn't put an address to ship it to, what's the server going to do with that? The server can't do anything with that. The server can't fill your order if you don't say how you're paying for it or where to send it to. So therefore, that data is doomed. <laughs> All right? It's not going to work. Now, we could have checks to catch it on the server side and display a message that says, hey, you forgot to enter that. But why not put those same checks on the client side? The advantage is this. Remember with the client side code, it doesn't have to go all the way to the internet and then come back. And secondly, it doesn't have to bother the server at all. All right? The server then is freed up to, to process reasonable requests, requests where there, are, where there is data there. Now, one thing that's a little tricky about validation is we can do different kinds of validation on the server that we can't easily do on the client. For example, if I had a credit card number, all right, credit card numbers are typically what, 15 or 16 digits, right? I could validate on the client side to make sure that someone typed in 16 numbers, all right, some 16 numbers, or, or digits rather. What I can't verify easily on the client side is whether that's a valid credit card number, all right? Um, whether it represents a credit card that was reported stolen, whether it represents a credit card that has expired or is over its limit or anything like that. So a lot of times you'll have additional validation done on the server side that you can't do or can't practically do on the client side. But at the very least, you can validate like the no-brainer items, like, hey, there better be something in that credit card box, all right? Otherwise, I know it's not right. The analogy I give is, is let's say you were applying for a job and they gave you an application. The receptionist gives you the application and you fill out the application you hand it to the receptionist. The receptionist is not the person that's responsible for hiring and firing you, right? But the receptionist can look at it, flip it on the other side, make sure you filled in all the stuff that you're supposed to fill in. Because why bother the human resource person with your application if you forgot to fill in a section, all right? The receptionist can tell that even without knowing the details about what they're looking for or whatever. Now, once the once you fill that in, the receptionist isn't going to look to see, gee, is a bachelor's of art history qualifying you to be a nuclear engineer or not, right? No, that's human resources job to do the more in-depth validation, all right? Okay, so anyhow, what we want to have happen is we want to stop this submitting to the server if there's nothing in these boxes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create code for an on submit event. And if you're taking notes, I'm missing something here, but we'll come back to it in a second. All right. 
on submit validate form, or validate form is a function. Now, I'm going to start out just validating the one field. And I'm going to have an if statement. Now, if you've done programming in other languages, you know that an if statement is a conditional statement. Under one condition, you do one thing. Under another condition, you do something else. So, I'm going to say if document get element by ID txt name dot value equals and I'm going to do sort of a just a very basic bare bones validation. I'm going to say alert you forgot the name. And that should be enclosed in quotes. All right. So, this is a conditional statement. What I mean by that is this is a statement that is either true or false. So there's two alternatives. Conditional statements are always of this nature. They're called Boolean expressions. True or false. One of two things is going to happen when this piece of code hits. Either the value of the thing on the page is equal to nothing, or it's not equal to nothing. That is, something's in it. If it's equal to nothing, we're going to pop up a message saying that we forgot the name. Notice the double equal signs. All right, you're not seeing double. All right, um, unless you see four of them, then you are seeing double. All right, the double equal signs are used for a comparison. So when you see double equal signs, it means does this equal that. When single equal signs are used, it's to assign the value to a variable, like we said document get element by id dot src equals and we put in a value. We only use one equal uh, um, sign there because we were giving a value to something. Here we're doing a comparison. So let's run this, see if it works. And then talk about what's missing. I click process form. Tells me I forgot the name. Okay, so far so good. But I click OK and it goes and it submits it anyhow. All right. What's wrong? What? Anyone that's done any other programming or it's, I have an idea of. Uh, you got to return. Yeah, you got to return the value of the function. You have to call, you have to tell whoever called the function, stop the presses. Yeah, this form is not valid, do not continue. So this will be the first instance we have where a function will have a return value. And you can think of a return value as being like the answer to a function. So in this case, the question is, is, is the form valid? Validate the form, is it valid? That's a yes or no question, that's a Boolean. It either is or it isn't, all right? We need to tell this user event whether it's valid or not so it knows whether to continue or not. All right. Now, you can either try to think through this or just take my word for it. It's easier to assume the form is valid and then look for cases where it's invalid. 
all right? Largely because for a form to be valid, everything has to be valid. But for a form to be invalid, if one thing's invalid, then the whole form's invalid. So I'm going to create a variable called be valid. Again, the B indicates it's a Boolean. And I'm going to assume that the form is valid. So I'm going to set that to true. True meaning that it is valid. If we get this error, I'm going to set be valid to false. Finally, when I'm done, I'm going to return be valid. And what does return mean? It means tell whoever called this function, this is my answer. All right? And then whoever called that function can do something with that answer. All right? For example, you might have a, in a payroll application, you might have a function that says, does this person get paid overtime? Well, there's a couple conditions in there, right? Are they an hourly employee, first of all? Right, because salary employees don't get paid overtime. Secondly, did they work more than 40 hours in a week? All right, if both of those are true, then the answer to that question is yes, this person gets paid overtime. If the answer to either of those questions is no, then no, the person doesn't get paid overtime. So we could call the function that says, does this person get paid overtime? We can then take that result of that function and say either, okay, let's go and pay him overtime, or no, nah, we don't need to pay this person overtime. Exactly. All right, so I added the return value in here. I assume the form is valid. If I find a problem, I set it's false, and I return false. Here's the one piece that was missing before. I'm sorry, I returned be valid, not be value. All right. Interesting thing is with JavaScript, it wouldn't, well, it would give me an error in that case. Now, what the final thing I need to do to make this work is I need to do return validate form. That's a little confusing for some people. All right. The reason is, is this is going to call this function and it's going to get returned back a true or false. This passes that value, true or false, back to the on submit event that the browser handles. And the browser is smart enough to know if this gets an on sub, if the on submit method gets returned a true, that it's okay to go ahead and submit the form. If the browser gets the on submit event in the browser gets returned to false, it knows stop the presses. So we'll go and run this. And boom, we get the error. No, I, it already had the, yeah. All right. Boom, you had the air, and it didn't submit it. All right, we saved the world. Right. Now, we could easily add in the code to do the age. Now, with the age, there's an additional thing, right? The age has to be a number. All right, so depending on, we'll, we'll look at this and we'll work on this uh, a little bit more on Wednesday, which is our last day of, not Wednesday, Thursday, uh, which, which is our last day of class. So um, I'll post this. What we're going to do now, though, is we're going to do the evaluation, the course evaluation. I need a volunteer to take this up to BU211J. Okay.